Hello, everyone, and welcome to Season 2 of the All Rise podcast, produced by Gonzaga University School of Law. I'm your host, Ryan McNeese. I'm a proud alumnus of GU Law, where I obtained my Juris Doctorate and MBA. I'm a lawyer and business owner in the Spokane community. In this season of the All Rise podcast, we are reflecting on the theme of Go Forth, inspired by the St. Ignatius of Loyola quote, Go Forth and Set the World on Fire. However, during the recording of many of these episodes, we weren't going very far physically because of safety measures in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Regardless, we felt that now, more than ever, we needed to connect with our community. Many of these interviews were recorded using Zoom and similar technology, and we apologize for the audio quality. During this episode, Dean Jacob Rooksby visits with Sandra Park. Sandra is a senior attorney with the ACLU Women's Rights Project. Her work focuses on advancing gender equality and challenging discrimination experienced by survivors of gender-based violence, and she was also counsel on the ACLU's successful 2013 U.S. Supreme Court challenge to human gene patents. During this conversation, she shares her insights and experience with the case. This is Jacob Rooksby, Dean of Gonzaga Law School. I'm excited to have with me today Sandra Park from the ACLU. Good morning, Sandra. Good morning. Thanks for taking time to speak with us a little bit about your work at the ACLU. Can you tell us what your current position is and what your history has been with the organization? Sure. I am a senior staff attorney in the National Office of the ACLU. I'm based in New York, um, and I work from the Women's Rights Project of the ACLU. I've been there 12 years now. What did you do before joining the ACLU? Sure. Um, After law school, I clerked for a year um, in the Southern District of New York for U.S. District Judge Alvin Hellerstein, and then I got a Scadden Fellowship to work at the Legal Aid Society in New York in the Bronx, Uh, and I was working on a project that represented immigrant survivors of domestic and sexual violence. So I'm really excited to have you here today. We're here for the Medicine, Music, and Mascots, Furthering Social Justice in the Age of Intellectual Property Conference. And you're a speaker on one of our panels, the panel on patent law. And I know you're going to be talking with our audience about your work in bringing the Myriad Genetics case. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about that litigation and how it started for you? So I started at the ACLU in 2007, and very early on in my tenure there, uh, I joined a team that was starting to think about whether we should bring a lawsuit challenging the practice of the Patent Office of granting patents on human genes. At the time, we had a science advisor at the ACLU who was not an attorney, but was identifying science policy issues for us to work on. Her name is Tanya Simoncelli, and gene patents was one of the issues she identified The ACLU had never brought a patent case, so this was an entirely new um, area for us to think about. And we looked into the issue on a sort of common sense level. I think many of us felt that it was very bizarre and wrong for the patent office to have granted these types of patents. And we started consulting with uh, scientists, pathologists, patient advocacy groups, all of whom for many years had believed that these patents were not a good idea, were detrimental to patient health, Uh, but in terms of law, they had just been accepted, and there was no legal challenge to them being thought about. There was no resistance to them in terms of a legal, um, in terms of their legal basis, and so we began researching and talking with folks and ultimately came to the position that we did want to bring this lawsuit on behalf of 20 plaintiffs, including pathologists, geneticists, patients, and patient advocacy groups, um, and we focused on the patents that have been issued to Myriad Genetics on BRCA1 and 2, and those are two genes connected with breast and ovarian cancer risk, uh, and we filed a lawsuit back in 2009. So this case was a landmark case in intellectual property law, and obviously went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court, where your client's position was vindicated in a unanimous decision. Can you talk to us a little bit about how the case was initially received when you first filed this lawsuit? What was the reaction you got from the news media? What was the reaction you got from the science community and also from the patent community? So when we filed the lawsuit, we sued Myriad Genetics and the University of Utah, which controlled the patents on BRCA1 and 2. And we also sued the Patent Office for its practice of issuing these patents. And our primary legal argument was under Section 101 of the Patent Act, 
which the Supreme Court had recognized for many years prohibited the patenting of laws of nature, natural phenomena, and abstract ideas. And our argument was, we thought, a relatively simple one, that DNA uh, is a product of nature, and simply by identifying that DNA and isolating it from the cell, the company Myriad had not invented anything. It should get credit for discovering those genes, but that was not an invention that it should be able to claim exclusive intellectual property rights over. Uh, when we filed that case on Section 101, um, there was pretty much very little Section 101 litigation happening, and legal, that legal claim in particular was one that the patent bar had um, not treated as a serious type of legal argument. Uh, and so I would say the news media actually received the lawsuit with great interest. Um, one of the things that we did in filing the lawsuit is we thought a lot about how to use the case to educate the public about this practice of patenting genes and the impact on real people. Uh, we knew we could not just treat this as an IP case, and we also knew that you know this was involved highly technical concepts in terms of patent law, in terms of genetics, and that the important thing for us to get across is how does this really hurt patients? And so our patient plaintiffs um, did a wonderful job explaining the impact of these patients on their own lives. Um, and so I would say a lot of the news media covered that, and they talked to our plaintiffs, they talked to the geneticist plaintiffs as well about how these patents had interfered with their scientific practices. Um, and so it's interesting because I think there was a strict divide in terms of the response. The media and the scientific community were very supportive. Uh, and then the patent bar and other folks within the patent world really thought we were, this case was ridiculous and thought that there was no legal basis for it. It should be thrown out. Um, there are a lot of blog posts saying we should be sanctioned as attorneys that, you know, we were really coming out of left field. Um, and I think that illustrates the divide around this issue that the patent bar had really been insulated in terms of thinking about the propriety of these patents, and when these patents were exposed to a larger community, including the public and the scientific communities, and the legal basis for challenging them, that there was a lot of receptiveness to that challenge because people knew how it had harmed patients. So you mentioned the harm to patients, and for those listening who may not fully understand what that means, can you describe for us a little bit more about why the patenting of human genes had harmed actual patients? What did that entail? So in granting the patents on the genes, what the patent office had done is allowed uh, specific companies or universities to essentially control all investigation and testing of those genes. Uh, so with respect to BRCA1 and 2, um, Myriad Genetics and the University of Utah controlled the patents. Myriad used its patent power to exclude any other lab from performing any type of genetic testing on BRCA1 and 2. And I think the key point is to recognize that the patents were on the genes, on the DNA itself. So we're not talking about a particular test that Myriad invented. Um, if we were talking about that, another lab could come along and create its own test and look at those same genes using a different form of analysis. Uh, but they couldn't do that because Myriad controlled the patents on the DNA itself and it used those patents to shut down other labs from providing other forms of genetic analysis on those two genes. Uh, and so, for example, two of our plaintiffs were geneticists at the University of Pennsylvania who had their own testing of BRCA1 and 2 and were threatened with lawsuits if, uh, if they continued that testing, uh, and they ultimately shut down their own testing. And what that meant for patients is that they only had one option. If they wanted to get BRCA1 and 2 tested, they had to go to Myriad Genetics. Myriad charged, <clears throat> excuse me, Myriad charged a premium for its testing. It had no competition. So even as the cost of doing genetic testing dropped over the years, Myriad's testing increased in price, again, because it had no competition. And there was also very serious concerns about the type of testing it was offering to patients, that the scientific community was aware of mutations that indicated um, a higher risk of breast and ovarian cancer, and Myriad was not including those mutations in the standard test that it offered. And so other labs were saying, we want to offer this testing on other mutations we know are harmful, 
um, and that you're not doing as part of your test, uh, and Myriad would not allow them to do that. And so the patients in that period of time that were getting test results back were getting false negatives. And that was established in a paper that was written um, by researchers at University of Washington. Uh, and so in terms of the accuracy of the test, the comprehensiveness, the cost, um, and even the chilling effect on being able to do research that would maybe lead to better testing methods, all of that was chilled by the fact that Myriad controlled these patents. One of the things that fascinates me about this case is the ACLU's involvement in it. You mentioned it was the first patent case that the ACLU had ever brought. Uh, in, in hearing about your background, I think it was the first patent case that you had ever brought. And what a case to bring. This was a, a game changer for the field of, of patent law. Can you talk to us a little bit about what did that look like for the team working on the case in terms of going from zero to 60 in an area of the law that many view as uh, quite complex and sophisticated, even setting aside the science that was involved, which is also complex and sophisticated, how did you prepare and how did the team prepare to really go to, go to battle on something uh, that had been you know, viewed for so long as unassailable and was forever going to be protectable? So we studied this issue for two years before we filed the lawsuit. We did not enter into this field lightly. Um, there were a lot of institutional considerations about, are we doing the right thing in bringing this lawsuit? You know, the fact that pretty much the patent bar seemed unified in its position in supporting these types of patents made us really think hard about, um, does this lawsuit accomplish the right goals for the larger public interest? And in speaking to all of the pathologists, the um, scientific community, we came to that conclusion. And so then the question was gearing up on the patent law part of it. Um, and, you know, the Section 101 jurisprudence at the time uh, went back many years, um, but there weren't hundreds of cases. You know, it's a body of case law that was relatively easy to get up to speed on. Um, and we thought in terms of its application to this case that it was very straightforward because we were dealing with the mere isolation of human DNA. And what Myriad had patented was in nature that it was trying to capture exclusive rights over our own genetic information to pre pre prevent others from testing that genetic information. Um, and so I think from that legal perspective, we were able to study that and gain expertise on Section 101 um, in a relatively quick period of time. Uh, and our biggest concern was really about the science and whether this was promoting patient health and scientific work. And that was what we focused a lot of our um, preparation in ensuring that that was the case. So the case was filed, I think, in 2009, is yes. that correct? Mm -hmm and eventually gets argued before the United States Supreme Court in 2013. The case is decided in favor of the plaintiffs that you represented. Talk to us a little bit about what you were thinking was as that case was heard before the U.S. Supreme Court. Did you think you would win? Did you think that an opinion would be authored by Justice Clarence Thomas unanimously in favor of the plaintiffs? Uh, that you'd represented, with, I suppose, one concurrence by Justice Scalia saying he didn't understand the science involved. Talk to us a little bit about that outcome and what it meant for you. So I think going in, we thought that we had a very good chance of winning. Um, and I'd say certainly by the time of the oral argument, where we heard so many of the questions of the justices I think really mirroring uh, the way we had thought about these patents um, and being concerned about where Myriad and the Patent Office had drawn the line between nature and what could be patented. Um, and I think if you listen to oral argument, one of the things that stood out for me is that Myriad's attorney never had a good answer for what could not be patented, what really fell within the realm of nature, in the realm of the commons. Uh, and a lot of their arguments basically suggest that there was no line there and that everything was a free-for-all that could potentially be patented. And I think ultimately the failure to answer that question um, really concerned many of the justices who spoke that day. 
Uh, I did not necessarily expect a unanimous decision, um, but I think uh, going in to in waiting for the decision, we thought we had a very good chance of prevailing. And I had, I think, assumed that maybe Justice Breyer would write the decision because he had written the decision um, that had come out shortly before in Mayo versus Prometheus and had expressed a lot of interest in these issues. Uh, so we were uh, somewhat surprised, but also pleased to see that Justice Thomas had written the decision and that obviously he had ruled in our favor in invalidating the patents on the DNA. So some detractors of the decision have said it's wrong on the law, but it's also wrong on the policy. And this was simply a policy decision by the United States Supreme Court, ultimately, and that they were swayed by rhetorical arguments about the impact of these practices on patients, which patent purists would say are irrelevant because this should be about whether an invention has met the eligibility and the requirements for patent and nothing more. And I know there was debate to that effect at the federal circuit level. How do you view those arguments? What would you say in response? What is the connection here between law and policy in mm -hmm. this area? Well, I think the policy considerations is really what drove us to bring the case. I think if we had simply thought, well, as a matter of law, these patents are invalid, that would not have led the ACLU to undertake this huge effort to challenge these patents. It was because of the very serious and documented concerns by patients, as well as um, uh, the medical community and the scientific community, um, that these patents were impeding their work and their ability to provide the best patient care. Uh, and I think you can see that even in the way the litigation unfolded, in terms of the 20 plaintiffs we had who represented all of those interests, all of the many dozens of amicus briefs that were filed by the American Medical Association, um, even genetic testing companies that thought these patents were standing in their way of providing high quality testing to patients. And then ultimately in the position the US government took, uh, we had sued the patent office uh, for its practice of issuing these patents. And by the time we got to the Supreme Court, the Solicitor General on behalf of the United States uh, had joined in our position in saying that these patents are invalid. And that was because they had then uh, consulted with other parts of the federal government, including NIH, and recognized that these patents were undermining the ability of, um, the ability of scientists and medical folks to do the kinds of advanced work um, that they wanted to do. Uh, and so I think in terms of the real policy effects, that was where we felt we stood on the strongest ground um, because of the support we had from the patient advocacy and scientific communities. So the decision comes down in 2013, and things then change rather rapidly in the marketplace for uh, these tests. The price goes down. Others are able to offer these tests. Um, other tests based upon gene patents are, are, are no longer held to be uh, valid. What's happening now, uh, almost six, seven years later? Can you talk to us a little bit about efforts in Congress and how uh, the public has reacted to this decision? So I would say overall we had tremendous um, support for the outcome of the decision. The day that it came out, uh, the director of NIH, who's still the director, Francis Collins, applauded the decision. Uh, many companies came out to announce that they were ready and just about to start offering BRCA testing at much cheaper costs. Uh, and one of the key points on that is we now know that there are many genes connected with breast and ovarian cancer risk. And so the idea of offering testing on those many genes in one test was very important and that that's something companies could now do and could now include BRCA1 and 2 in their panels to really offer comprehensive testing to patients. And so that's all, all out there now in the marketplace in a way that was not the case um, before the decision. Uh, and so I think in terms of the patient responses and in, in the genetic testing community, there was overwhelming support for the decision. Uh, what I would say is there was much opposition from the patent bar, and um, since the decision, there have been, there's been a lot of activity among patent bar associations in formulating proposals to overturn the decision, including 
decisions that the Supreme Court issued in the Mayo versus Prometheus case, as well as a subsequent case called Alice. Um, and those proposals have been out there for several years. Uh, this past year, Senators Coons and Tillis uh, had started to organize and draft proposals based on the concerns raised by patent attorneys and other stakeholders. And so we've seen a draft proposal that would explicitly abrogate all court precedent, recognizing the prohibition on laws of nature, um, products of nature, and abstract ideas as patent eligible. And that has obviously raised huge alarm bells for us, and we've been very involved in organizing uh, a response to the, that proposal. Uh, one thing that really concerns me is the senators had not talked to any of the scientists, any of the patient advocates that supported these decisions. Um, they'd really been consulting with patent attorneys and certain um, stakeholders in industry uh, in formulating this. And those con consultations were all closed door. There was no real opportunity for public input until some hearings that happened this summer. Um, and even those were very limited in terms of the perspectives that were shared. So, um, so yes, yeah, so we are now facing this, for me, what is a strange situation where, you know, we litigated a case that resulted in a unanimous decision written by Justice Thomas, and now we have a faction in Congress wanting to overturn that decision and even go a step further in eradicating all of the case law in this arena. Um, and we're very concerned about what that would do ultimately for the types of patents that could be issued. I think of this case as a classic example of public interest lawyering at work. You and your colleagues hearing of a practice that struck you as unjust, learning more about it, and bringing a case. It's a fundamentally American story about our judicial system and what's possible. And for those who might be inspired by hearing your story and your experience, what advice do you give to them, to aspiring public interest lawyers? Well, I think uh, one piece of advice definitely is to do your homework, but not do not be intimidated. So as you we talked about earlier, this was a new area for us. Uh, you know, patent attorneys, I think, thought we were ridiculous in entering this field, um, but we we believe very strongly we were in the right. And as we did our homework and as we consulted with others, um, we realized that this was something we could really do and bring forward. Um, and so I think there's a mix of, you know, doing the research and doing, um, doing the work to prepare yourself, but also having the confidence in what you think is right in a particular situation to move forward. Um, and then the other big lesson for me was really about building a coalition and how important that was for us. Uh, too often with patent litigation, it's framed as one company against another. And one of our goals with this lawsuit was to bring together a coalition of stakeholders um, from patients to scientists who actually did not really talk to each other about this issue at all and to raise um, through their voices that there was a larger public interest at stake with this type of patent beyond what we typically think about in patent disputes. And that was hugely important um, in really articulating what the public interest here was. And I think that's a lesson that we can bring to all sorts of public interest advocacy we do. Sandra Park, it's been a pleasure to get to speak with you. Thank you for sharing your time and your experience and your expertise with Gonzaga Law School. Thank you very much. This episode of the All Rise podcast was produced by Gonzaga University School of Law with assistance from our colleagues at Gonzaga Instructional Development and Design. A special thanks goes to our alumni and donors who continue to support our mission of providing an excellent legal education informed by our humanistic, Jesuit, and Catholic traditions and values. Did you enjoy this episode? Let us know. Give us a shout out on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You know the drill. Or you can learn more about this podcast and us at law.gonzaga.edu. Thanks for listening and go Zags.